I like that you actually just already own a beret. You're like, this is. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> All right. So, hello. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I've got my cup of tea. I've got a big glass of water. I am ready to go. It's very late at night for me right now. So, we're going to yeah, truck on it, through. It feels very late at night for me right now, despite the fact that it is not yet eight o'clock, but. It's been a night. It's been a night at our house. And if there's anybody there who's listening or watching with some sort of adult beverage, please just have one for me. Have a sip. Have one for me, please. Toddlers are are something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big feelings. (laughs) Anyway, so who are we? We are the Belladonna Watch Club. Yeah, get comfy with us while we dig into iconic shows and movies that one of us has never seen. So the rules are one of us has seen it and the other is coming with fresh eyes. And we are still on Gilmore Girls. Season one, episode five, Cinnamon's Wake. (laughs) This is definitely, I would say, one of the quirkier episodes of the series but there's a lot that that measure up to this level of quirk like this is this excellent is getting right into it mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. so as the name implies this is the episode where their rory and lorelei's neighbor babette and maury have a pet cat named cinnamon and cinnamon dies and the town comes together and has a wake for the cat The other storyline happening in this episode is Rory's teacher, Max Medina, has asked Lorelai out on a date. And after some hesitation, she finally accepts, uh, but did not tell Rory that that was happening and didn't find a moment to actually give her the heads up. And then Max Medina shows up on Lorelai's doorstep with Rory seeing Max on the porch and she's just like what Rory and Dean actually get a little bit more FaceTime this in this episode as well so we finally get a a much bigger chunk of of Dean so Mm -hmm. tell me tell me what did you think (laughs) I loved this episode I loved it um I loved the the pairings or like the parallels of pairs of people, men and women, all the way through. Um, I loved getting to know Babette and Maury so much more. Um, Because at first, I really wasn't sure who they were or what the heck they had to do with anything, but they are incredible. Uh, Folks listening and not viewing at home, you will see I've got a little uh, uh, beret on that you can't really see very well, but I'm I'm, I'm dressed the part. I'm dressed inspired very much by, uh, by Maury and Babette. (laughs) <laughs> all in black black beret and and just for this evening i've got some shades got some nice uh ah. dark <laughs> roy orbison <laughs> style shades but just to you know play the part i was very moved by them they are fascinating characters and uh yeah i w- i was uh i laughed out loud so many times in this episode there are tiny little gems and it's just an overall great episode, I think. In the opening scene, we've got Rory, Lorelai, and Emily, and they're all around the dinner table. Mm-hmm. And uh, we learn that that Richard is out of town in Germany somewhere. Some relative, distant-ish relative of Lorelai's has passed away. Aunt Lorraine or something like that. Cousin Claudia. Cousin Claudia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wrote it down actually because I have an anecdote, a personal anecdote. <laughs> I, I think it really sets the, the tone of the episode and sort of introduces a theme of the episode where it's really hard to tell when Emily or Lorelai is joking. Their delivery is so perfect and so straight and uh, even with each other, they can't tell when they're joking. Lorelai seems to have the upper hand. Germany. Is Dad's firm insuring Nazis now? Your father doesn't know any Nazis. I know, Mom. I was just... What? Joking. As far as jokes and, and wit, she seems to be sort of winning this uh, this conversation. Until right at the end, when we get this amazing zing from Emily. Without um, any kind of hesitation or any kind of clues otherwise. Uh, 
leads Lorelai to thinking that uh, they are friends with a Nazi. Oh, wait. Rudolph Gottfried. <laughs> which, which I, it's, and she plays it so straight that you, uh, what? And uh, Lorelai is outraged by this. You, you socialized with a known Nazi? That's despicable. That's heinous. No, dear. That was a joke. <laughs> and just, just, just pow, 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 pow. She knows her moments. They're dangerous moments, but she knows her moments and they're great. <laughs> To me, that part or that joke actually read as like one of those people who just like don't know what a joke actually is. Because to us, Lorelai <laughs> is just like naturally funny. And and for me, this was like one of those people who like try to say a joke, but it's actually just like mean, <laughs> you know, where you're, they just say something and you're like, what? And they're like, oh, that was a joke. You're like, that was terrible. Like, that's a, that's no, a joke. No, <laughs> no, it's because she, she's taking Lorelai at her moment so she she's got Lorelai to that moment of like of believing everything and taking everything she says as 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 truth and important and instruction and de you know detail and everything um and she just totally twists her right at that moment she she builds her up and then just obviously you should know I'm joking how dare you be so serious in this moment <laughs> just oh it's cruel but it's great that scene at the beginning where they're talking about the obscure cousin that she's like, you've never, or she's like, I've never met her, yada, yada. And you're like, yeah, your cousin died, blah, blah, blah. It reminded me of a time when my dad sent my sister and I an email with like no preamble or, or much information. I don't even remember the person's name. That's how much of a non-person in my life he was. But he was essentially oh, like, Ross died. And we're like, mm. Ross. Oh, dear. <laughs> and if it's important for us to know that he died, why are you emailing us? Like, it can't, <laughs> shouldn't this be at the very least a phone call? And I called my sister first. He's like, Who's Ross? Like, <laughs> she's like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I suppose. Apparently he was some obscure cousin, but the fact that we were both just like, what? And then, the f yeah, you're emailing us that somebody died? And I, I don't know. It just seemed, it was ridiculous. Like, Dad, what? Who? What are you doing? So we got some glimpses in this episode of Rory being a little bit less put together. Like, we saw her under stress in, in the previous episode, but then that was under like a really high pressure situation and a lot happening. And here mm -hmm. in this episode, we get a little bit of how anxious she can be and how, oh, you know, totally. rule follow and like the panic. And I just hear mm -hmm. this, this little clip. It makes me laugh every time I see it. Yeah, I know. But you go to school here. You, you have to get off the bus. Hey, hey he wait, has wait, to get wait, off wait, the wait. bus. Uh, wait, uh, you're forgetting something. <laughs> Buses make stops. The way that she's just like, oh my god, it. he's gonna go all the way to Hartford and he's gonna miss school <laughs> and he can't. Oh my god, he needs to get off the bus. Like the way he just, she just panics. Her composure with him since like the previous whatever previous time scene that we saw them together, um, it just like devolves completely. And then like by the end of this episode as well, she's just a blubbering mess, like spitting out random words. <laughs> it's really entertaining. I guess she may have had time to think about how in the last episode, Lane told her that Dean was asking about her. And so maybe she's just been like, what do you mean? Why was he asking about me? And then he's there and she's like, ah, <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. What do I do? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, there's, there, there are a few things more dangerous than, uh, than an idle mind or a mind with suggestion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, poor thing. Yeah, we get some, some gold mine moments in this um your actually your hat your beret reminds me very much of the scene with michelle and the the french delegation <laughs> at the inn um the fact that he's just like he's just like i think it was french people are insufferable and lorelei is like no way <laughs> Actually, you know, I'm let's just roll right into another clip. This is another one that I just go for I laugh out loud. Michelle is one of my absolute favorite characters. I'll say no, Sophie. 
Vous avez l'accent français Vous ne parlez pas français Sir, I'm just a simple country boy from Texas. I do not understand the français business you're babbling about. Pardon. He knows you are not from Texas. <laughs> Smile when you say that. <laughs> Michelle, I told you there was going to be a French group here for a couple of days, and it is your job to keep them happy. Oh, Laura, I, I don't know how many French people you've met over the years, but most of them are insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even try to, like, cover it up, change his accent, nothing. It's like, vous parlez français? Non, sorry. <laughs> I am from French. Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Patty at the grocery store with Rory. Yes. Like, here we are. She has some self awareness here, which I appreciate. But I was just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Rory. Hello. Try a plum. They're better than sex. Um, no thanks. Fresh fruit always has such a a sensuality about it. <laughs> are you too young for this? Definitely. <laughs> well, what are you here for, honey? What? Oh, well, I, I just... Oh, I see what you're here for. It's Dean the bag oh, boy. Oh, that wouldn't fit in a basket. No, 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 no. Brilliant line. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, 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 no. <laughs> And then they go on. She's like, no, I don't know him. And like, don't tell anybody. And Miss Patty's like, I won't tell anyone. You don't know that boy. <laughs> <laughs> made me laugh so hard. Something I had forgotten until I was doing a rewatch of the episodes that we've covered so far. Um, I forgot about Miss Patty. R according to Rory, as, as in she tells Dean, Miss Patty was once on Broadway. And mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That that would make a lot of sense, and that adds a really excellent an excellent portion to her backstory that's going on in my brain, in my imagination. <laughs> yeah, um, she's bringing the big city to the small town with her mm -hmm. flair, fabulousness. Of course, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and it would explain why she's got such a such a flamboyant and you know and and, and big city presence and imagination. So. Good for her. <laughs> Something I like about the, the the bit with the plum is that it's <laughs> it's demonstrating some kind of a personal pleasure, I think. You know, she says, try a plum, they're better than sex. Like, I mean she's she's getting such joy out of a plum. And I think <laughs> this is one of several well, one of a handful of themes I think that run through this episode is joy in unusual places but like personal pleasures in unusual places and getting joy from different from different places so um this is just how miss patty is she has no hang-ups about it and and then some of the like the behaviors and the the things that we see some of the other characters do later in this in this episode they just all sort of add to that i think of just this is the way i am this is where i find my joy this is my pleasure and you it's really really sweet i think that adds it just adds a really nice color to to the episode and i think is part of what makes it so enjoyable yeah something that uh, the word that comes to mind uh when i think of miss patty is unapologetic <laughs> and, yeah of course yeah and and so like even when she realizes that she says something kind of inappropriate and like you know she's 16 you know she's like oh is this ooh. um she... Which it could be. I mean, it might not be totally inappropriate. Like, she's a teenager. Maybe she is actually interested in talking about sex, but she doesn't have the right person to talk to about it yet. I don't, I don't yeah. know. So, yeah. Uh, the fact that, yeah, she can she can recognize that she's like, mm, you don't want to be hearing about this, but then doesn't care. Like, I would go yeah. into like a spiral, like a shame <laughs> spiral of like, oh, my God, I can't believe I said that to her. And that's so inappropriate. And this guy's just like, whatever. I have my plum. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. <laughs> Well, I love this whole scene, this whole grocery store scene. I love the weirdness of this, like, of, of, of Rory being like, I want to be in your space, but I don't, and I can't speak to you. Like, just the, the weirdness of that scene, I think, the weirdness of that kind of moment is just so well encapsulated in that scene, just the way it's shot, the way there's, like, other, like, characters and people talking to her, and... Just trying to do some kind of a cover up. 
which cover up and like pretense, I think, um, is another major theme in this episode is, is covering things up, acting, acting as if, as if something is one way when like the subtext is right there and it's, it's absolutely not that way. Uh, this is me nerding out, you see. Uh, <laughs> for those who don't know, uh, I have a theater background. Um, I get really, really invested in like story and like scene and theater creation and production. And as an, as a sometimes actress, I'm, I'm so into breaking down scenes in that way. This is just what I do. It's what I did at university. So, so bear with me. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm nerding out tonight and you're getting the Bring full. Bring it. Yes. <laughs> uh, the first big moment of like pretending and saying things that like sort of acting a scene that isn't really happening is Lorelai and Mr. Medina at the coffee shop. So they have, they have formulated this sort of accidental, quotes, uh, date, date, accidental coffee shop meetup thing that is, by appearances, just a casual encounter of like, oh, I didn't know you'd be here. No, but they planned it. Oh, I didn't know you'd be here. And they're talking through supposedly, you know, if this were to happen, if we were to meet like this and if I were to have some kind of interest in you blah 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 and speaking in the very theoretical when it's so so obvious even to me the total like flirting blind person here <laughs> I'm so I cannot read signals as you as we well know um it is dead clear that they are absolutely hardcore flirting with each other planning something they are they're they're both so very much there and they're not ready to but you can tell they're just about just about saying I am so into you I want this to happen this is gonna happen let's make a date you know but but they're they're saying that without saying it I happen to have a little clip of them at the coffee shop being coy and silly a soul of discretion when it comes to delicate relationships. Dated a lot of Chilton moms, huh? No, I'm in any relationship. Work, family. Oh, so you have things to hide in all aspects of your life. Very interesting. <sighs> Do you have any hemlock back there? Arsenic, something quick. Maybe some belladonna. Thank <laughs> 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 <Like that. laughs> um, What I like about this is that she's poking all of the holes right but like you know she's into it and that's her teasing that's her having fun and that's even though she's she's putting up that that front of of resistance it's almost for show so that she can like tell herself that she tried <laughs> yeah oh yeah oh absolutely absolutely the okay so this is me learning how to read flirtation signals and cues the more of this um he grabs her elbow for the second time in this episode. He does it before when they're actually at the uh, the bake sale at Chilton. Mm. <laughs> he gently grabs her elbow, then it happens again. And th the, the camera makes a clear shot of her actually looking down, noticing it, and a big old smile. Or not a big smile, but, you know, an obvious smile. I love this. This is so dead on and clear, and I just... Love knowing that, ah, oh, we're seeing her actually fall and melt and consider, but actually be sort of not just all in her brain about it. She's, she's, she's feeling it. So yeah, just like you said, being sort of coy, but, but poking the holes all at the same time. But you can see that you can really see it filter through. And I love that. Yeah, that, that bake sale, the whole thing made me laugh because in, in one of the earlier scenes when we're introduced to the idea that the bake sale is happening, immediately my like mom hackles went up because <laughs> Rory comes into the kitchen and is like, mom, shouldn't you be baking? There's a bake sale at school today. And I was like, excuse you? Shouldn't you be baking the bake sale? And then Fully she does clarify. 16 year old. Like, right? Then she clarifies that like all the parents contribute and it has to like, it's just the way that it is there. But immediately I was like, excuse you, miss. And then Max Medina comes on to her at that bake sale, like a oh, pretty hard. And yeah, I'll be honest, yeah. I did not like how much he was pressing her. 
Yeah. I think maybe this is just my avoidant thing, but like, mm, even if she does want to date him, which we find out she does, it's it's clear that she's uncomfortable about it in that conversation. Like she says, it's wrong, it's weird, and I don't know. Multiple times she said something like that. And so I'm kind of, but I'm going to, I'm going to put it down to turn of the century, turn of the millennium, early 2000s kind of romance. And definitely like through the 90s and the early 2000s, I think flirtation, especially on the men's side, was a little bit more aggressive than yeah. I'm comfortable with. So it was a, I'm just you know, you by that. it kind of yeah. vibe. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't really like that either. Like his, his attitude towards her comes off as smug. Like, how could mm -hmm. you not possibly want this? And even mm -hmm. though she does make it clear, even then, that she basically would be in other circumstances. Like, the fact that it's it's not him that's the problem. It's the fact that he's the teacher and Rory goes there, yes. you know. And instead of him respecting that, he just, like, he pushes and he pushes and he pushes. Yeah. And that that feels, yeah, like a turn of the century, like no means try harder yes kind of vibe yeah. which yeah. i don't love and i remember watching it the first time and being less bothered by it like he's mm -hmm. still he's still I, I i don't think i was ever fully into the way that this started and there's his level mm -hmm. of pursuing her mm. but now i'm like Ick. Ooh. Mm. okay that's a lot. It, it does make sense, though, that they would make a character choice like that for someone who is pursuing Lorelai. You need, like, I can't imagine if he was any bit, like, wimpier or weaker or any bit less self-confident, I don't think it would work. I think we would instantly be like, mm, no, Lorelai's way too strong for him, like, way too, you know, mm. backbone for him. So I could, like, I can concede it there, but... He still made me uncomfortable quite a bit in that first episode. Yeah, first scene, rather. Yeah, fair enough. And there's a scene at Luke's diner after this bake sale where she's talking to Suki about kind of what to do. And so there are two things that I love about this episode. One of them I have a clip of, but the first one is the fact that Suki goes behind the, the bar counter. <laughs> and starts like fixing everybody's meals and like garnishes the guy's plate and puts lemon on his turkey sandwich and all of that stuff and it just she's so comfortable and just happy to do it and then luke mm -hmm. comes in and he yells at her he gets he so yells. oh my god i was scared of him that is a very <laughs> very rare loud luke and me I'm, I'm a goody two shoes and I play by the rules most of the time. Um, and so I was, I was like, what are you doing? So cute. What is this? What is it? And then of course he comes out, but he's like louder than I was expecting him to be. And he's angrier than I was expecting him to be, but he's totally allowed to be angry. Cause yeah, that's his space. It's his, but, and he has some great line about the Dalai Lama and his yoga mat and stuff. And like, <laughs> just, I mean, she must have done this before, which oh, is yeah. why he would get so angry yeah i didn't remember him getting that loud and angry either and he full-on yells at her like i if i was eating in that restaurant i would have been like oh my god i am leaving this is a dangerous <laughs> place <laughs> yeah but yeah and so she's trying to lorelei is trying to decide whether or not she should go on this date and has this charming interaction plus be great to get you know what you know no, I don't. You know. He knows. You know? Yeah, I know. Suki! <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> you know. We all know. We all know. <laughs> we all know. Yeah. Even what Lorelai wants to get. Yeah. Even Jenny knows. Suki. Even, I even Jenny know. knows. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they make her so naive is really mm -hmm. sweet. Naive or, or this is a very 2023 hypothesis, potentially, or suggestion rather, potentially, is she on the asexual spectrum? Well, I don't know. I don't know. 
I don't know. I'm just going to put it out there for anybody listening in. Uh, I consider myself um, uh, under that on that spectrum, uh, a little uh, gray asexual representation over here. But uh, I'm, I don't usually look out for hints of that in characters. But you know, sometimes it's 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 nice. Certainly at the time, <laughs> at the time, no one was talking about that. No one would put that in a show. But. I like watching it with modern eyes and thinking like, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe she's just not thinking about it. I don't know. I don't know. We have yet to see any of, uh, of Suki's romantic, uh, uh, inclinations. Who knows? She is the one that brought up the orgy threesome in a previous episode though. So (laughs) (laughs) sex is Mm -hmm. on her mind from time to time. Maybe not so close to her True. personal life, but seeing two sets True. of twins it's, got her mind it's going. Not, <laughs> it's not foreign to her. Well, maybe she's like me. Maybe she reads fan fiction. It's really weird, maybe. smutty fan fiction. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm trying to think of what like famous chefs there were back in the day. But, like <laughs> Mario Batali fan fiction. Sure. Is that who the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wolfgang dear. Puck fan fiction. Mm. Mm-hmm. Didn't he have great hair or something like that? I'm pretty oh, sure I don't know. Pretty awesome hair. Oh, hopefully. All I know <laughs> is that he did a line of like TV dinners after. Yeah, he was oh. one of those ones that like sold out and did like I don't know like manwich style stuff. Oh well, you know, hard times. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> so then. We get to the troubles with cinnamon. Cinnamon mm. possibly ate some bad clams or possibly died of natural causes in her human years of 260 years old. <laughs> I loved that. That, that, oh God, what a genius of a show to have a scene about a dead cat and it can get you laughing out loud right in the middle of the scene. Like, come on. <laughs> It's just absolutely yeah, it brilliant. So the delivery by that actress was just incredible. And and we have Rory and Lorelai going over to Babette and Maury's house to comfort them in their time of need. Mm-hmm. And Rory is being so sweet. She's like, yes. we'll stay as long as you want. It's like whatever you need. And I think of myself as a 16-year-old and it would have been like... Ugh mom can I just like go home like, this is ridiculous <laughs> you know like I, mm-hmm. I I was this stereotypical like teenager in that way that was like just not I'd be wanting to do my nails I'd be wanting to be on MSN with my friends I <laughs> like why are we at these old people's houses like I'm going home and then you have Rory being sweet as like, little peach she's so mm-hmm. nice well this is another scene of like pretense you know saying saying one thing saying the words that mean something but like the subtext really is they do actually find it ridiculous like rory finds it ridiculous as we learn in the very next scene she's explaining to lane that like yes of course i wanted to burst out laughing but but she didn't like it's it appears it comes across as genuine comfort and support and you know that like that's the that's the intention but they do find it pretty ridiculous. And I think that what the audience learns um, from this scene and from this this um, behavior of Rory's is that we don't even really know uh, Maury and Babette, but clearly we love them. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's what we are learning from the behavior of Lorelai and Rory in this scene. They're like, okay, well, we love them. We have to. They are, they, they're worth, you know, pretending for. And, uh, and comforting so <laughs> yeah I actually have a clip from I think think it's the part of Rory being sweet mm. I don't remember what I did we'll find out <laughs> okay oh no it's not that it's the story of how or when cinnamon died oh yes and it is absurd like they took a ridiculous moment mm-hmm. and then they took it so much further and they just made it <laughs> insane looked like she was sleeping i thought she was asleep so i nudged her and she didn't wake i gave her a push and she rolled off the couch and since i just waxed the floor she went shooting across the room and then she knocked over the lamp and she still didn't move i knew it was over oh god my baby <laughs> So 
so when you first get into their house, you see there's like a broken lamp on the floor. And you're like, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> and you just picture just like shooting this cat across the room. <laughs> It's so ridiculous, and they're, they are all doing such a brilliant job of just holding it together, playing it so straight, playing it so serious. Sally Struthers is the actress who plays Babette. Um, she was quite a popular actress, I think in the early 80s, late 70s, or at least she was on a show that I cannot remember the name of, but she, um, she had her heyday uh, back then in the day, and like, oh bless her, just being able to deliver something so bizarre in in just a, the sweetest kindest most sentimental way it's just great yeah everything they that they do with almost all of the secondary characters is just outrageous like they yes. are so unbelievable like we saw kirk at the at the grocery store at dozy's market and as the new assistant manager, and then he's so serious with Miss Patty about her fruit, and she can't sample anymore. And she's like, "Oh, I've been sampling at this establishment for years." And then you see him again at the wake, <laughs> and he's so serious again about his job. Like, I apologize, you're the Miss Patty. Like, it just—it's so over the top. <laughs> and with Babette, it's basically like I feel like Babette is like that level the whole series. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> And they've even made her house ridiculous. Everything in her house is very short. <laughs> Why are the doors so short? <laughs> I didn't notice this until the second time I was watching it. I'm like, what is happening here? Because everyone has to duck. Everybody has to duck. <laughs> what is going on here? And then like, Lorelai has to sit Lauren down to help six... with the dishes because all the counters are Babette height. <laughs> And all the cupboards are very low. And like Lorelai's opening cupboards, but they're like at her, at her chest height. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's my kind of house. I want a house like that. Yeah, yeah, of course, made for you. Fantastic. Yeah. And then Babette says that when Maury first moved in, he got a few concussions, but then he got used to it. <laughs> like he's having to talk. Bless them so much. Oh my god. I I I. Okay. Here's another, I think, minor, th not theme, but like a little like recurring thing throughout this episode is, so I mentioned the like, the pairs, like the male-female pairs all the way through. Some of them are romantic, some of them are potential romantic, some of them are not. But like Maury and Babette, they are absolutely just like made for one another. Just yep. made for one another. And y y you get this, this great, y you see them together at the start with cinnamon um taking her along on her on her walk in the wagon in the and wagon then, with like, like the awning for privacy. beautiful oh absolutely of course um then they are grieving together then grieving apart at the wake itself and then right at the end of the of the episode we get this great moment this great scene with them looking at the at the constellations together looking up at the stars and so we know they're going to be okay. Do you want to know some of the other pairs that I noticed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. So the more pairs. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so obviously we get uh, Lorelai and Mr. Medina, who I'm going to keep calling Mr. Medina. I know his name is Max, but I just can't do it. Anyway, Lorelai and Mr. Medina. I'll come around at one point, I'm sure. Their relations there and their interplay is is, is matching wits it's the uh the you know you say saying something and maybe you're misleading and it's the like you said the poking holes and the kind of the the you know just sort of riling them up pressing the buttons but then it's the flirting it's the flirting and it's the sort of the grown-ups flirting then of course we have rory and dean rory and dean just in this totally <laughs> just chaotic teenage miscommunications understanding but i think also we have suki and luke not a romantic mm -hmm. pairing but they are sort of they're they they're frenemies fr <laughs> sure yeah frenemies, <laughs> frenemies they are they're doing like the same job in a way but different tactics suki is in his place when she's behind the counter um, and she doesn't belong there, so they have that, bah, 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 you know. But then at the wake itself, they have the same job, which is to 
essentially cater the week. And their ways of doing it are so completely different. She has the whole spread that this needs to be up here. This needs to be warmed up. This needs to be, you know, all the, the plates and the dishes and things. And his is, you know, packed away in little Tupperware or whatever it is, plops it on the on the counter. All right, let's eat, you know, and everyone's ready to go. But it's all okay. No one has to win. You know, neither of them are doing it the right way or the wrong way. It's they're doing the same job, but different takes of 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 doing the same job but yeah they're they're <laughs> definitely butting heads and you get that great moment of them arriving at the wake coming through the door at the same time and they just you know squeeze and squish through the door they don't make it through just classic it's classic you know cinema theatrical slapstick all of these pairs um oh and i guess final one is yeah miss patty and kirk kirk who <laughs> I recognized from multiple previous episodes, he just gets around. I wonder if he's going to actually stick in this role. I don't know. I don't know. Because he was installing the DSL. Yep. Then he was um, in charge of the swans. And now oh, he's yes. showing up at the grocery store. Like, <laughs> this guy. This guy. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't be surprised if we see him do something else. I wouldn't be surprised at all. <laughs> Yeah, well, hold on to your beret. <laughs> hold on oh. to your hat. <laughs> Kirk, is, Kirk is a character. I mean, they're all oh, characters. Great. We There are still so many more characters that we get to meet as this goes on, yes. too. It's so ridiculous. Um, but yeah, the, the scene in the wake with the food, I thought it was really fun because it's this, like, competition but it's not full blown animosity. It's mm -hmm. it's but it's also not just like friendly competition either because they're not like chirping each other and like making it, you know. Like they still feel the like the other is like encroaching on their territory a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. both of them would be perfectly happy being the only person bringing food. <laughs> and mm -hmm. while they're not in direct competition with one another because one of them is fine dining and one of them is diner food, it's a small town. It, you know, there's not always room for both of them. And there like really is, but both of them want to kind of be the one to have the job, you know? And I think having like Lorelai as the common denominator also... Mm -hmm adds a little bit more competition to them because Luke always wants to impress Lorelai. And when Lorelai mm -hmm. is organizing a wake for the neighbor's cat, Luke wants to be the one to show up for her. And mm -hmm. Suki wants to be the one to show up for her. So they're almost like quibbling over Lorelai when they're quibbling over the, you know the food set up and stuff definitely definitely i i had like small ideas of that small like wonderings of that in my head but i just wasn't wasn't too sure i thought i might be reaching but i'm really glad that you mentioned that and so while they're at the wake max medina shows up at the house so lorelei still has not told rory that she was going to be going out with max and Lorelai's over at Babette and Maury's house. Rory is outside after having just had a, an awkward encounter with Dean, I think. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, do you have a second? No, I have gum. And then just like panic. <laughs> it's the so, worst. It's the most disheveled we've seen her behave just the entire time we've known her. Just like she's not even kind of going uh, uh, and disappearing. She's just still speaking. Girl, what is going on? And this is cool. Because Lorelai was kind of doing the same thing at the beginning of the episode. So here we have both of our, like, strong, witty, confident, speaking women. And and they're just blah, blah, blah <laughs> by yep. this point. It's great. <laughs> and, and just actually to stay on Dean for a bit, he ends up approaching Rory and saying, okay, I get it. I thought you were interested and you're not. And I'm just going to, I'm going to back off. But I wanted to let you know that like, I recognize that I might've been making you uncomfortable or whatever. And I'm, I'm going to stop. And I thought that was really cool of him. So to, considerate. Yeah. To be yeah. Like, whoops, sorry. And I'm going to leave you alone now. Yeah. Which is yeah. the opposite even... of Max Medina. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, look at the, look at these guys behaving. And this was actually something that came to mind just a short while ago that like this episode really demonstrates so many different types of male behavior 
and like or like the the male role aggressive romantic considerate how am i speaking of 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 luke uh wanting to be territorial a like ooh. <laughs> yeah, territorial, territorial but also yeah provider and any and and maury as well maury just like sweet sentimental artistic and and really really you can tell he's one of those like pensive kind of beatnik type of guys poetic and it's just what a great episode <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it really is. And and now that you bring up Maury and his kind of sensitive side, one of the things that I love about Maury and Babette is that they just adore everything that the other person does. Like they're so yeah. genuinely like she loves his music and, mm -hmm. you know, he's into her crazy cat life. And but they're just so they just love each other and they're so yeah. invested. They're not just like coexisting alongside one another. They're actually showing interest and devotion to each mm -hmm. other. And it's so refreshing because oftentimes, especially like in the 2000s, you see these like married couples where it's like the wife is the nag or the husband's like just lazy and watches sports or, you know, like those kinds of dynamics that are often perpetuated in media about married couples mm -hmm. and having them be so in love with one another is Absolutely. gorgeous. Yeah. The, at the wake, um, just at the end of the, the bit with Lorelai and, and Babette, Babette overhears the song that, uh, Cinnamon's song that, uh, that Maury is playing with the, surrounded by his, his peers and his friends and his support and the song, I, I vaguely recognized it, but I did have to look up on trivia what it was. And it's called I Thought About You. It's a classic jazz uh -huh. standard called I Thought About You. And it's just such a sweet, so perfect for a, you know, a, a, a farewell type of song, as well as just a, a fondness, fond, fondness song. Um, and of course, we've got Miss Patty on the bongos, like... <laughs> I watched that scene so intently. I was like, is she actually playing the bongos or does she just look like she's playing the bongos? And I think like she was on beat. Like it looked very much like it was her doing it, whether it was or not. But like she, it looked, I think, I think it could have been. Oh yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so yeah, we're at the wake. Max Medina shows up and Lorelai is trying to convince him <laughs> that there was a genuine crisis <laughs> and that something important happened and so here here we go I'm heartbroken i just completely forgot about our, our date and forget him no no you're memorable I, i've been uh, memorabling you all all week it's just we had a little emergency rory is rory okay no rory's fine it's the neighbor's cat the neighbor's cat she died <laughs> she died so i i grabbed this clip in particular because of how even though he's like kind of smug he's also very honest mm -hmm. and even though he comes across as pushy he's not sneaky he's not he doesn't seem manipulative in like a backhanded kind of like sleazy way and so he says like i'm heartbroken and like i'm forgettable and you can tell that he's genuinely hurt and they are, are trying to make him seem like a decent honorable you know kind of guy and which he is and i like that he also seemed to have genuine concern when she said there was a family emergency and he immediately is like oh my god is rory okay like his whole demeanor just shifts and then mm. when it's about the cat he switches right back he's like okay listen if you don't want to see me that's fine but like don't give me this about a cat funeral like <laughs> <laughs> which fair enough fair, fair enough. enough he's not from that town he's not from stars hollow he doesn't know how it is yeah and like you feel for him i was also kind of annoyed that he just kind of like threw in the towel right away yes. after all of that where it's like he, he worked so hard to get her to agree to go on a date and she genuinely is like trying to tell him, no, I want to see you. And he's like, forget about it. Like, I know that he's trying to protect himself, but that kind of bothered me a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so they do agree to try again another time. So we will see more of Max Medina. That was not the end of it. But is it just me? Did he remind you at all of Justin Trudeau? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of it, 
but now I can't unsee it. Oh right? My God. I had that thought <laughs> last episode, and then I was like, oh no. And so now when I'm watching this, I'm just like, it's Justin Trudeau and Lorelai Gilmore. Okay, so at this point, Rory had seen Max Medina. She's super pissed at Lorelai. Uh, and they have a confrontation where Rory basically tells Lorelai, like, that you lied to me. And it's like, well, no, I didn't tell you. And there's the difference. But Rory's like, I'm not having any of that. You still didn't tell me. And I'm upset about that. The way that Lorelai addresses Rory in this scene reminds me so much of myself and something that I would say to somebody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can't believe that you didn't tell me about this. Why wouldn't you tell me? Because I thought you were going to take it bad. Thank God I was wrong. Okay. just so like oh but like this is what's happening can we talk about this for a second because i kind of called it and that's what i was trying to avoid everybody like that feels very much like the kind of thing that i would say mm -hmm. yes i'm noticing more and more uh uh similarities between uh one of my best friends and this character that i'm seeing on the screen it is making her more familiar to me so that's good <laughs> it makes her more endearing to me as well hmm. sometimes it's alarming when <laughs> it's not serving her well <laughs> true yeah, yeah yeah well i mean I, I guess in this case i'm more like rory than mm -hmm. anybody else in the show right now and I've, I've already brought it up num a number of times just how uh how 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 often i can put myself in her place <laughs> i don't maybe know what that says about me at 34 maybe that's why we get along so well because we are like lorelei and rory i think so yes yes i think so <laughs> and i think we 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 meet at the same levels that they do and we, um, I, I think we, we fill in the same blanks as they do. <laughs> yeah, a yeah. little bit more studious, a little bit more outgoing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it works. Yeah, All right, lovely. so I have one last clip because, 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 because the episode did not have enough Emily in it overall. And so they needed to bring oh. her back at the end to remind us how Emily is always Emily, no matter what. Of course. <laughs> well, she bookends the episode. She she yes. introduces it and then she finishes it. Yes, let's. Yeah. Possible to reach. Well, there's no messages on the machine, Mom. I don't leave messages. If I wanted to talk to a machine, I talked to my VCR. Where were you? At a wake. A what? A wake, a, uh, a funeral. A funeral? Whose? Who's for the neighbor's uh, cat? <laughs> Mom? Hold on, I'm looking up aneurysm in our medical dictionary to see if I just had one. <laughs> I love it. Rory's like, Mom, stop. <laughs> Mom, stop. And Laura like, what? What? What could possibly be the problem? Do you not see what you're about to walk into, Mom? Yeah. And I love that Rory is so in the know now about the dynamics that she's just like, oh, no, Mom. Like, mm -hmm. And, you know, in that moment, Lorelai is not thinking about Cousin Claudia. And cousin Claudia's funeral. It's like if I wanted to talk to a machine, I would talk to my VCR. And then I just picture her like crouched under the TV, like "Hello, <laughs> <laughs> are you the there?" Way. And even, even for those times, that was very dated. Like it's she's she's already behind the times in two thousand. You know, <laughs> like, fair enough. I'm in a DVD player then. Do you know something I like about the ending of this episode and the. Well, I guess where this episode wraps up in its, uh, as far as like, is Rory okay with Lorelai potentially dating her teacher? We don't actually get a final answer. Rory doesn't even give a real answer. We we sort of have to dig a little bit, and well, actually, even Lorelai digs because she's not well. She's not she's not quite confident in the response from Rory. She, she's, she's not quite convinced yet. Um, and you can tell she cared so much. Like, Rory, is this going to be weird for you? Or is it okay? It's like, she really, really wants a yes, mom, go ahead and do it. But she's not getting it. Um, Rory's avoidance of an answer, she still leaves it all Lorelai's responsibility. Like, and, and, and it's up to her judgment. It's, it's up to Lorelai to, to decide, is this 
okay or is it crossing the line what what are our boundaries here so very very interesting very interesting writing i think and we also have a bit of uh the tables have turned on Lorelai. Now Lorelai is doing the chasing. So yeah. we had the entire episode where, you know, Max was going after her and going after her and not getting a straight answer and not getting a, a, a definitive response. And then Rory learned it from her mama and does it right <laughs> back to her. And mm -hmm. you know that in the same vein that it's not a hard no, the hard no doesn't happen. There is discussions and reasons and things being said, but yeah, nothing definitive. And then she has to like coax it out of her. And even then all she says is, I have a, a test on Friday. Can you keep them out late on Thursday? Right. Which they is become like co-conspirators here. It's so yeah. good. <laughs> I'm as as the fresh eyes, the new viewer, I'm not totally cool with her dating Mr. Medina. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I know we're gonna see more of him. I don't know how far that's going to go, but right at this moment, I'm not totally okay with it. I, I, I think there's something, something wrong there, but that's also me being who I am at this point in time, at this point in my life. You know, I, I'm, I'm a real romantic, but I'm also like, somehow I just have this like cold edge to me just being like, nah, whatever, write it off. <laughs> so I am yeah, not so keen, but I'm absolutely in love with Babette and Maury and I just I, I love that we actually get that moment with them at the end of the episode where they are he's got his arm around her and they're looking up at the stars and we know they're going to be okay because they've just suffered basically the death of a family member right and and there's they're going to grieve through this together and they're going to be okay together um yeah and actually what I really did want to talk about for this episode was um, sort of the, the kindness, but also the sort of mild humor with which they handled grief and grieving. Um, for listeners who don't know, um, my mom passed away at the beginning of last year. And so without really intending to, I've sort of been picking up on how different movies and films and, and TV shows handle grief. And just I'm a bit more tuned in to, to depictions of grief in media. And um, yes, though, this is a sort of bit of a ridiculous, a bit silly, quite quirky and, and, and unusual. I really, really like that Babette's grief is, is really wonderful and really genuine. She is, she's already thinking about what she needs to do next, but she, like, she's still, she's hurting and she's raw, um, but she, she's on to thinking of how she has to move on and in this, she has a message and a sort of a, a thought for, for Lorelai, which is you eventually have to figure out what your life is going to be when you're not busy taking care of somebody else. And that's such a weird and difficult point to come to when you are grieving the loss of somebody. So my mom, I wasn't so much her carer, but in a way I was and, you know, looking after her. Um, and then you sort of, you start again after you lose somebody and this is the position I'm in right now is I'm trying to figure out what my life is going to be without my mom. And uh, it's a very, it's, it's a, it, it's a hip, it could be a really, really heavy point, but obviously in this context, well, in the con the greater context of the episode, it Lorelai growing into a different position, a different role. Um, and, and when she's not having to take care of her little baby, her little eight year old baby Rory, you know, Rory is, Rory's growing up. And so what is Lorelai's life going to be? It, the message is for her, but it's also a message I think from, from Babette just on, on grief and on losing somebody and, and moving on. So I, I just thought that was such a beautiful scene they didn't push it so much to make it really really you know heartbreaking or anything like that but it's just really tender really heartful I think um and so that really really stood out to me as just a great great bit yeah mm. I I liked that as well and just to your point of um Lorelai having to learn how what did like about Rory not needing her care anymore. We actually get a little mm -hmm. glimpse of that where Lorelai leaves a perfect opening 
to tell her about Dean and mm. she doesn't. You know, when she says, I'm going to meet, I'm an open book, ask me anything, I'll tell you anything and everything. And mm -hmm. then Rory doesn't tell her. And that I think is immediately following that conversation with Babette. And so you're seeing right there that Rory is already starting to pull away from mm -hmm. her like extremely close relationship with her mom. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, Lorelai says, mentioned something about like, um, you'll meet some great guy. And we have oh, this right. tiny little moment of Rory glances to the floor. Like she's already got somebody on her mind. She's thinking of something. And just, just that slight looking away, you can tell she's, she's thinking about something and not voicing her thoughts like she normally does. I don't really have a lot to add on the grief point because I don't have it necessarily from the point of view that that you do. Um, but just knowing sort of the like life challenges that you're experiencing right now, like it makes sense that, that you picked up on that and that that was a part of the episode that those of us who haven't necessarily been through it would gloss over and just see the humor. And well, I, I uh, appreciated that it was done with humor. I really, really liked that because the because there's yeah, there's there's humor and there's sort of ridiculousness in grieving as well. Like, because the emotions are just so huge, so huge, and like you 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 never know how you're gonna you never know how you're gonna be from one minute to the next, and it it, it is it's ridiculous and it's um <laughs> it's just so beyond just anything normal. And if uh, because I said ridiculous, I, a, a line just came to my mind. Weird things happening in like what could be somber grieving moments. Um, so the wake is brilliant. I think the whole wake scene is fantastic. And I love that we have this like almost intrusion from uh, Michelle. We have Michelle show up to this wake thinking it's a party. And he's like, oh, it's a party. And you didn't tell me about it. You didn't invite me. No, no, no. It's, it's a wake. And he steps in and he's like, what the heck's going on here? I have this thing for Lorelai. <laughs> this is him continuing his uh i have a simple man from texas calls out to this guy the same guy i think from from the diner earlier you who he haw man yes. <laughs> <laughs> you who he haw man <laughs> i laughed so hard <laughs> it just totally breaks the the any of the <laughs> any of the seriousness of, of a wake of a you know, of a funeral type scene like just just brilliant uh, i sincerely oh, I guess, hope okay. that in the script he's written as he haw man i think he's the same guy who knew what laura oh he knew was ready to he was get. yeah he yeah is. that's him just before i move on from here i needed to let you know i don't think he i don't know if i've ever told you about this but um my first job was at a small very small catering business um and just by chance, most of my first gigs were funerals and wakes, um, which was not the norm at all. Like typically it would be like office, like, like luncheon things, or it would be weddings or, you know, that sort of thing. But it just so happened that when I started, I think out of the first like eight, I didn't work for them for very long, but like maybe eight, I think we did about four or five funerals um and wakes and uh <laughs> just i think that really set me up for like learning how to um uh how to just behave and how to be present for oh hi <laughs> oh oh what a perfect that's my cat addition. Yeah, perfect that's whiskey addition. sorry to interrupt but she came over no of course well she knew she knew we were talking about poor old cinnamon rest of her soul Wonder I wonder if I can hear, that. hear her purring. Yeah. A little bit of ASMR. <laughs> A little bit of cat stuff going on today. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, so, okay. Back on track. Your catering job was all funerals and wakes? Pretty much, yes, yeah. And and my boss, the lady who owned the business, she she was pointing out to me, like, it isn't always like this. I don't know. It's just, it's a busy time right now for <laughs> everyone's croaking. I don't know what's happening. I learned very quickly how to just uh just how how to be. It was one of one of my weird forms of customer service, I guess. Um uh, uh, and in a very unusual setting, but I I do not remember you ever 
having worked for a catering company. This is news to me or I'm it, not. I, I it was know. my first ever job. My first ever job. It was uh, because I, I, so I took a year off after high school. Okay. I didn't go immediately into college or university. And um, yeah, one of our, one of our uh, classmates, her mom had a little catering business. Miss Kate. <laughs> She's rubbing herself all over the microphone. <laughs> That might be a whole other ASMR if it's coming through. She's just like, no, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think in, uh, we've we've sort of been getting the the message uh, in previous episodes, but also that this episode really drives it home that this town, Stars Hollow, it has established ways about it um, mm. that like they hold a wake for a cat and like. Maybe it's ridiculous. Maybe it's maybe a bunch of the townspeople just think like this is so dumb, but no one causes a scene about it. They show up because it's about community and about support. It's just it's how they are. They know what the neighbors are like. That's how they are. And we let them be that way. And like it's almost like there's a a community agreement for what's okay and what's not. And like even in uh, in the case of Miss Patty and uh and and Kirk uh, Kirk learns that Miss Patty, this is what she does. This is what's accepted. She goes to the grocery store and she samples the produce. She's not causing trouble. And I highly doubt she's like stealing hundreds of dollars worth of whatever. She just, she's just there. And think of how much she actually gives back to the community as well. There's, there's just like a, 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 a sort of a set of just understood rules, understood there's understanding in the community and um, her little interaction with Kirk at the wake when he <laughs> apologizes and he acknowledges that this is what he got wrong. She says, this is so great. I always forgive once. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, I, I, I want to grow up and be like her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that, that she added that once just to, just to scare him a little, because he comes to her with almost reverence, right? Like, I didn't realize you're the Miss Patty. Mm -hmm. Like, my mistake. Please accept our forgiveness. Like, he's groveling, you know? And she's like, mm-hmm, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same thing with, with Luke. Nobody bats an eye at him yelling at Suki. Nobody. Not even mm -hmm. Lorelai. Like, if somebody came in and, like, yelled at my friend, I would have been like, gloves are off, excuse you. And... <laughs> The fact that everybody's just like, oh, it's Luke. Well, oh, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. Suki doesn't even care. Some people would just be crying. And I would be. Oh, my you gosh. You would be crying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never see a show my face again. <laughs> yeah. And she doesn't even care. She's like, whoops, pissed off Luke. Do, 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 do. Like, <laughs> she doesn't care. Nobody cares. No. Because that's just who he no. is. They're just like, oh, it's Luke. The curmudgeon. Mm -hmm. and there's also a bit, I think Lorelai has a quick interaction with Suki, um, right before the end. So all of this stuff's gone down, and she's trying to explain to Rory why Mr. Medina's on the like what's about to go down with Mr. Medina. And Suki says, She'll understand. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, because everyone understands who people are, how people are. Like, she'll understand. You're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Duh, we all are, of course, you know. And and just this this level of of understanding and just acknowledgement and agreement of just like how people are, and it's okay. It's really yeah. cool that the I whole town is together for it. And I think I think that's uh just because she shows up for a few minutes for the entirety of the episode. Um, Lane starts off oh, the episode Lane. skanking to rancid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Just, and just I love that it's before time. school. Like, what kid gets up at <laughs> six o'clock to go to your friend's house to skank to Rancid? Like, <laughs> we we know that Rory's school starts at what eight? Takes her at least half an hour, forty minutes on the bus. So that means she's leaving mm -hmm. at you know twenty after seven at the latest. You know, but she has to get to the bus and all that. So, like, who are all these kids who are just like out in the morning? Teenagers, first of all, teenagers are usually up until like two. <laughs> mm -hmm. they don't they're not getting up at six to go to your friend's house you're not just like casually hopping on like a random bus 
skanking for the for the uninformed and the uninitiated and the unknowing uh is some really great uh, i don't know what you call it punk dancing it actually Stop. began in in the 60s yes oh yes it began in the 60s uh sort of northern uh i think it was a crossover from the caribbean styles of dancing mixed in with some northern soul uh in northern england this was, of course, from the huge migration of people from the Caribbean, and particularly Jamaican dance halls where they danced to, as Lisa said, ska and reggae. The British mods of the 60s adopted and altered this ska dancing from the dance halls into what we now know as punk skanking. And uh, and you got this cool, funky kind of... Bah, 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 bah. You got some brass going on in there. So, yeah, northern beat, northern soul. and then But eventually it became a, a dance for all genres. A dance for all genres. <laughs> and I guess the way we know it is this great kind of... Yeah, this this whole episode is just covered in like punky, weird, beatnik style, bluesy, jazz, everything. And I adore it. <laughs> Good. And I guess before we finish this off, the title, the title of the episode is Cinnamon's Wake. And I believe it's trying to be, it's alluding to a book called Finnegan's Wake, which was a book uh, by the Irish author James Joyce. I looked this up because I didn't know who it was by. Um, but Finnegan's Wake, I, I had no idea what actually it was about. But then as soon as I was looking it up, it was all clicking and clicking to me that it was a very like surreal almost novel novel it's like non-linear plot it's got like an experimental style and it's really difficult to read and understand it plays with like um dreams and memories and uh in the wikipedia article it mentions that it went largely unread by the general public so <laughs> people might know about it and like even if it's sold uh people didn't actually read it so just wanted to just wanted to throw that in there i mean i've got my beret on i need to be a bit of an academic and there you go <laughs> i couldn't let the episode fly without talking about finnegan's week you gotta be a beatnik a hipster <laughs> just me over here skanking to rancid <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. and final final thing um so rory reads a lot we know this i am not a literature person I'm a theater person. I'm, I don't know English literature very well. But she is reading well, when she's on the bus with Dean. She's always talking about books with Dean. Interesting. Um, she is reading A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, which is a book that uh, talks about uh, what sort of early feminism, really, sort of like the 1920s, about women's intellectual potential, remarks on uh, women's financial status when women's financial class being a hindrance to women's uh, uh advancement in uh in in the world of well fiction writing and uh and all kinds of things so anyway just thought i'd put that in there as well i said i'd well, nerd virginia out wolf, i had to finish it up virginia wolf is mentioned in another show that we've recently watched as well sex education mave has been yes. reading Virginia Woolf and Sylvia Plath. <laughs> She's timeless. Oh, bless her. I'm going to put up... <laughs> I'm going to put up an image here of Virginia Woolf. And, like, I'm going to just do myself here a side profile. Maybe it won't work. I don't know if it will. But I've been told that I resemble Virginia Woolf. All right. I think that's it. Oh. I think I've actually yeah. finally covered everything that I wrote down on here. <laughs> so we are the Belladonna Watch Club. We'll be back next week. Yes, indeed. Yep. yep. Catch us next Thursday. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And uh, we'll see you next week here on YouTube. And also, wherever you stream your podcasts, we're, uh, we're making our way out among the world of podcasting streamers. Yay! Awesome. Bye-bye! Bye-bye. See you later.